This tea break is supported by today's book choice, The History of Ocean Software. A software revolution in the 80s saw Ocean at the forefront of publishing and creative development here in the UK, and this book gives a fantastic insight into the industry as told firsthand by those on the inside. Grab yourselves a hardback or paperback copy at fusionretrobooks.com now, or use the link in the description. And now, on with the tea break. Ocean Software was a name that you couldn't escape in the 8 and 16-bit era, one of the largest game developers and publishers on the scene from landing in 1983 through to the mid-90s when they vanished and were gobbled up by French games company Infograms. The business was set up and run by David Ward and John Woods, but the product, the video games, were produced by a team which included today's guest, games developer Paul Owens. Welcome, Paul. Hi. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining us. If we were to dig way back before Ocean started in 1983, there was another company called Spectrum Games where you worked. Just explain to us, Paul, where Spectrum Games fits into the Ocean story, if you will. Well, uh, yeah, Dave Ward was actually running a um, a company to supply um, props to uh, film companies like Granada. And uh, I was doing a degree in... Um, Polymer chemistry um, at Manchester, and in the halls I wanted some money, so I, I answered an advert. I'd been playing around with uh, uh, computers for a while. I had a ZX80, a ZX81, and I'd just bought a Spectrum, and um, I answered the advert, went in, and David said, "Right, well, we, we're thinking of getting into this gaming kind of thing, but we've not any, any games yet. But we've got some adverts, um, and uh, we're about to run some. So, can you write some games?" So I. I I had a version of um, Road Frog Hopper, whatever you want to call it, on the ZX81. And I asked him if he, if he wanted to see that. He said, no, not really. He said, I'm interested in Spectrum. We want colour. So uh, I said, well, I can write you one. Um, you know, I'm off for a few weeks, uh, no uni for a while. So, uh, and the next day, I, you know, I started. Um, so started writing games. And we'd had a few in from the, the games that had been sent in by other people. And um, we release them as Spectrum Games. We had them, in fact, I've got, if you, if you bear with me. Yeah, yeah, please show us anything um, that you've got. So, yeah. Oh, nicely There's framed. My... So we've got Road Frog, uh, Caterpillar, Monster yeah. Muncher. I can't see what the top right one is. What's the other one? Um, that's the, the Robotron, uh, Frenzy. Um, <laughs> you slipped there. Yeah. That's really... <laughs> well, close. I mean, we called them whatever we called them, really. But... Um, so those came in, and and they were just sort of samples, and I, I took, took those, and I've never really been any good at graphics, but I uh, did the load of screen and, um, uh, in Melbourne Drawer, and we had them sent off, and, and started to sell a few through the newspapers. Yeah, so you were having games sent in, but in-house, were you the sole developer at this point? I was originally, yeah. Yeah, there was, no, there was just me, and then we had a few guys join us, um, but I think by that time we were probably talking about being ocean. Um, so the only games really released on the Spectrum games were my Road Frog, my version of Road Frog, and um, and those that were sent in, the, the ones that you've just seen. Yeah. But there is one missing, but I, don't, I can't remember which one it is. Okay, okay. Well, I remember. I, I seem to understand that David Ward of Spectrum Games and, and later the, the co-founder of Ocean wasn't entirely convinced that arcade okay, games weren't just a passing fad. Did you share that same sentiment with him? Um, I didn't have a view, to be honest with you. I was just making money at, uh, during uni. I, I never actually went back to uni. I stayed stayed with David, so obviously it worked. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, he, he, he thought it may be just a flash in the pan. Um, but I, I think I, my view at the time was actually no. no I mean, it's, it's the computers are here to stay. And whatever we use them for, whether it be business or gaming or, or other, really, uh, control systems, I think, was because of my father's uh, backgrounds in motor racing and engineering. Um, so I could see possibilities there. Um, they were here to stay. You know, there were things that you could do with computers that you couldn't do with anything else, and that, that included in the gaming world. Mm. And, uh, do you think David's attitude that it might be a bubble that's going to burst at any time might have led to um, tight time schedules to just get these games and made before the perceived bubble bursts? Or not? Um, I think that's one thing, but I think more. It's a commercial 
uh, operation like any other. Um, uh, I mean, speak to others about we we did have a laugh writing games in the early days. Uh, we did uh, early days of Ocean when more programmers came along. Um, but it the key issue was that you needed to turn get product out there because you had advertising schedules, you had Christmases to meet. The more you could get out there, the more you could sell. I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's, I, let's I, not talk about quality yet. But yeah. well, I did read a story in the in the Ocean Book, which I've got here, um, involving a hammer and fifty thousand tapes. Ah, <laughs> right. Yeah. So <laughs> rushing to get out for. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan Smith, um, despite what popular press might say, he was a good friend of mine. Um, he used to call me Buggy Owens, and he was quite right. I mean, I did <laughs> leave a few bugs in. And Kong was originally uh, scheduled for release under the Spectrum Games uh, banner, and um, John had quite a few produced, and they were outside the docks in the Raleigh building. We were just on the side of the canal in the centre of Manchester there. And I found a bug right at the last minute, which meant oh, you, you no. can get third screen and uh, John gave me a hammer and a stiff talking to and um, I had to smash these things up Uh, I wish I'd have kept a few actually because they're probably worth a few quid now yeah yeah they'd be the like the ET of the spectrum world (laughs) (laughs) so um, you you found your footing in coding your skills are developing and you've proven yourself a, a valuable developer to David there how do we then make the leap from spectrum games to ocean was it an entirely new company a rebranding how did this happen it was doing better than I think David expected. I mean, you'd have to ask David this, and we'll, you know, memory's gone. It's a while back now, it's 1982, 83, but um, things were going better than expected. And um, uh, work was ramping up, sales were ramping up. And David had, a, uh, had an old friend in John who was a partner and had obviously discussed it. John, John was keen to get involved. He came down. Um, and one of the things that I think they recognized in with respect to differentiation of the product it, it, spectrum games wasn't a wonderful title um so there was various discussions about what the new title would be of the company they wouldn't they were going to change it because it wasn't just spectrums it was they, they didn't want to limit themselves to for, to a single platform there was amstrad there was the bbc there was all sorts coming along at the time so uh, a, a new game, a new name was announced, and I think John was the one that made the final decision. I'm sure David uh, agreed to it, but I wasn't party to that conversation. Some, somewhere in a hotel, having a drink somewhere, if I remember rightly, uh, it was finally decided on. And um, yeah, J- John spoke to me the, the morning after with a big anger. Over, so I said, "Right, we're going to change the name. It's Ocean." And, um, and Ocean was born. Yeah. Yeah, I, w- I wasn't was it Ocean really. <laughs> well before long you were working on a, a very well-known game i don't know if this was your first correct me if, if it wasn't uh was daily thompson the first title that you worked on no then? so i did road frog spectrum games right i, I did kong kong also spectrum games but actually only released under the ocean title so like yeah if the early kong there's one on the shelf behind me there the early kong um uh, cassettes still had the uh, Spectrum Games colouring and things like that in, in, in there. Um, and then the next one after that was uh, Daily Thompson's. Right, okay. And how did Daily Thompson's, um, how did the game idea, how was that conceived? Were you involved in that part or were you just a programmer at a desk who gets handed? No, no, no. I, yeah, I get involved in all sorts of things really. Mm. So, I mean, David didn't, or John, it, it, it varied depending on what the task was, would speak to me. Uh, Dave Collier, uh, was an early programmer with us as well. He was uh, primarily on the Commodore side. Um, so I ended up uh, the Z80 based systems and, and David kind of ended up the 6502 process based systems. Um, uh, David used to work for a arcade games manufacturer in Wigan and um, uh, we used to look at, we used to go down to Wigan and have a look and see what the new games were on, on the arcades themselves. So we'd seen track and field. Um, David had a view that, you know, if we, if we have game ideas and we were always thinking of them, you know, what can we do? Um, then we can try and tie them to something. And because it's really, he, he had a great deal of faith in the publicity of um, well, the, the PR of attaching it to something well known, um, whether that be films that 
in, in later times, it, um, or Daley Thompson's in the early case. Mm. So we took the concept of track and field, not the track and field game as such, um, and adapted it for Daley. And um, but yeah, that was a discussion. You know, can we do it? Uh, what we what kind of things are we going to do? How how long have we got to write it? Um, you know, can we get Daley Thompson involved? There was all sorts of issues about not being able, to, Daley not being able to earn money um, because the Olympics was an amateur situation there. Um, Daley came down one day and had a look at, by the way, while it was in development. Oh, you got to meet him. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He asked about the colour of the character. Okay. And I went through all of the Spectrum's possible options and he he ended up, yeah, okay, white it is. <laughs> <laughs> nice guy, actually, really nice guy. Good, yeah. good. Well, for, for those who perhaps don't know, Daley Thompson was a very popular decathlete in the 80s and he would have been at the Los Angeles Olympics in 84, which was the year of the game's release. Uh, a British icon, I'd say, at the time. Uh, was the game ever rebranded elsewhere with, with a different athlete or was it? were you solely a, a UK operation at this time? No, we. Yeah, it was early days. So the American side of the operation, Ocean of America, wasn't really off the ground uh, at that time, and also the Spectrum wasn't uh, available. But it, it didn't seem to make any difference. I mean, I, I, um, I have a place in Bulgaria and occasionally speak to some Russians, and Russians of my age or slightly younger remember the game fondly. Uh, didn't care that it was Daley Thompson or whoever. It just liked they just liked the game, which is good because, yeah. Um, if if you actually like playing the game rather than owning it, um, then that's a good, that's a good yeah. thing, I think. Yeah. And just take a moment, if you're watching uh, and you played Daily Thompson, this is the man who cost you a fortune in broken joysticks. Yeah, this is it the face. It wasn't designed for joysticks. <laughs> it was designed for rubber keys. My little badge here. I got my, my, you got oh, you got your little badge there. Oh, your Spectrum badge. Yeah. yeah. Rubber keys. Yeah. I've got my original... Uh, development spectrums up on the shelf here yeah um, and i think i read in the book that you it's actually faster you'll get better times if you use the keys instead of a joystick yeah. is that right yeah all the testing we did so the kempson joystick uh came along probably it, it was there at the beginning uh but we didn't develop the joysticks primarily and i think it was david wanted well, we've got to do it with the kempson so i had to i had to detect whether he had a, a joystick in there and, and the way you, it, there are a couple of ways of doing that but it took a while to suss it out so you're actually we slow you down if you've got uh, a joystick plugged in. oh wow okay uh, yeah <laughs> as simple as that um, you are slowed down yeah yeah because the the period of time that you can s switch one to the other um in a key, on a keyboard is is uh, less than you could do in, in physically with a joystick. So we wanted to make it very similar to a joystick, um, but we didn't envisage the fact that joysticks would be used so much. And it, it, it's quite funny watching the kids playing at the shows. I remember, um, and yeah, we went through a few as well, and and they said, no, right, you can use the keys. Yeah, that's, that's what it was for. Well, if I ever find myself in a tournament situation, then I'll opt for the keyboard. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we hear a lot of stories about the bedroom coders in the UK in this era, but it sounds like you were in an altogether more organised operation. Did you have a sense that you were more more serious about the industry than others uh, that you were no. competing with? No. No? Was, was it just not. a gigantic bedroom full of dosing coders? Um, <laughs> yeah, kind of. I, I mean, a lot of work actually went on in the bedroom. We didn't, you know, the offices were open from nine to whenever we closed, but... Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd take the work home and carry on working. Some, if we were close to a deadline, it, 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 sometimes it'd be three days solid. Because uh, we, we, you know, we promised that we'd, we'd get the masters out. Uh, the biggest bugbear was trying to get the uh, previews out to the uh, press and uh, the magazines. Because um, you had to have something working. And uh, that was always a killer, that, yeah. So we worked at home, and did design documents come into this part of the process or at this point <laughs> no. were the games yeah largely locked away <laughs> in the coder's head no not till later not till we started doing the nintendo stuff we had discussions and meetings about uh design forms but not documents we did we had when we started getting graphic artists we had storyboards as well um but they were very loose really loose so now we were just hacking them as we say now yeah yeah uh, well um 
there's another story that came out in the book that I was reading today, which was told by David Selwood. Um, along the way, Ocean acquired the rights to the bankrupt publishers Imagine, who were a company famous for buying Ferraris until the money ran out. But mm. according to David, um, Ocean didn't afford you a Ferrari, but you did get to drive the boss's Porsche once. Is that right? Yeah. So I, <laughs> well, I had an XR3, but I, um, so I used to get a salary. Um, but, uh, before we started running a for- proper company, if you like, I, I had um, royalties on uh, the con, I think it was. So um, uh, I got some royalty money and I ended up with a, a car of my own. Um, but no, we didn't do, it was really for, for the press that um, but Paul, uh, our sales guy, had a, a Porsche. Uh, 944 and we were late for uh to go into ablex in birmingham one day to master and i can't remember what, what game it was then um but um yeah so paul i've got a motor racing history with my family and i've always been fast six fast cars and uh, and i've done a little bit of race motor racing as well so um he let me drive and it was a mistake and I frightened the hell out of him and he was really quiet and I didn't realise why and so we actually got to Aflex. He was quiet as a sheep. He was tripping it up. Never again, never, again, never, again, never, never, never. Yeah. And in, yeah, I, I had to go down on my own after that. <laughs> Excellent. Punch back two it was, yeah. Nice, nice. Um, well, I recently spoke to Coder Jim Bagley um, oh, and he explained okay. how he quite happily coded thousands of lines of assembler at his desk with a rubber key ZX Spectrum. Uh, mm. And I know at one point you were tasked with streamlining the, the creation process by coming up with a development environment. I don't know if you were tasked with it or if you took it upon yourself to try and streamline things. Um, yeah, a bit of both. Um, yeah. So I what think... did that comprise of then, this new dev environment for the Spectrum? Well, well the first problem is we were going through uh, three or four Spectrums every month. Um, the rubber keys just didn't last for you typing on them. And we tried different keyboards and plugging them in. The trouble is the interfaces always went wrong after a month. So we were doing the same thing. So uh, we had to look around for different systems. And there was a Tatung Einstein um, Mm -hmm. Z80-based system um, based on operating system CPM, the Forerunner to all. You've still got CPM stuff in your Windows 10 now Mm -hmm. uh, and Linux. Uh, But, um, yeah, so we found this, and it had proper disks in it that um, you know you can drop in a cup of tea and still kind of work. Yeah, big old industrial looking unit with a nice chunky was, keyboard, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and a, and a decent screen, and it also allowed you to separate your, your development environment from your target environment, whatever that be, Amstrad or, and port cross code. If because a lot of the code is actually quite similar on the Amstrad than it, it would be on a, on the Spectrum. So, um, but we didn't have an, a, a decent assembler for it. Um, so I wrote an assembler for it and. Um, it kind of got adopted. The thing was, I'd been down to Sinclair's, and they they were writing stuff on um, on Vax mainframes. Oh wow! Okay. So, yeah, um, and we were looking. I was looking at these Vax mainframes and just thinking, uh, different world. Um, but um, yeah, so we ended up. We also we tried Amigas later on, and we tried a few other machines. But the Amstram seemed to work. Um, sorry. The yeah, Tatung Einstein seemed to work well, um, so we stuck with them. And it was just we we got more and more tools as we as the day went on. If it, if we found that we needed something, um, so we we kind of invented a, a little bit of a language in, in in some areas as well. So you'd only have to type a couple of keystrokes, and you'd end up with a routine that would uh, point put a sprite on a screen, for example, or something like that. Um, yeah, not not many people use that to be honest with you. Yeah, um, yeah. So with that new system in place, you must have been ready to kick out a flurry of new titles. Uh, um, what did you create? Yeah. Ne- what came for you after Daily Thompson? What were your next titles? Uh, well, I was involved with Unchback as well. Uh, we had a guy join us from school. Um, Christian, that's it. Christian Urquhart. Yeah. So Christian, we went down to see him, and he he did he just really did the menu systems and one of the screens, I think, for dailies. Um, and uh, he was supposed to be writing on back, and it, it was it was struggling a little bit with that. So I wrote most of that. Um, I mean, uh, Christian might remember different, but uh, yeah, I've, st- I've got the st- I've still got the source code here. So um, then we did, I think, Cavalon. Um, 
don't remember a lot of that. Um, and, and to be honest, I've forgotten half the games. It, Mark Jones used to be my graphic artist later on, reminded me of a few that I've completely forgotten about. Yeah, but you must have had the follow-up to Daily Thompson. Were you yeah, involved the super in Supertest? Test. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we did Unchback 2. Mm, I've uh, only got the Commodore 64 version here, I think. Would you have worked on oh, that one? Two? You would have worked no, on the Spectrum no, no. version. I mean, David, yeah. yeah, I think David was involved. That might have been Bill, actually. I can't remember if it was Bill Byrne or David, that one. Um, but uh, we didn't... Yeah, we were just throwing them out. We didn't bother putting our name. I didn't bother putting my names on any of the games, so you won't find them on Unchback. Uh, I think it, was, it wasn't until late Super Test or something you'll actually start, or Mr. Wimpy, even you'll start to see my name appearing on the stuff, titles. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got here um, some of the ones that stood out for me were Short Circuit, um, the Spectrum Port of Wisbull, and Grizel or Contra to our American friends. You worked yeah, on all Grisel's of these. Mine. We, yeah, yeah Wisbull was the one Mark reminded me of. I didn't do a great deal of that. It had already been written, but, but uh, most of it I just patched it together and fixed it. There were a huge number of titles coming out of Ocean. Were there any games coming out of the stable that you, that you admired from afar but didn't get to work on that you can remember? Uh, not till later. So Adam's Family Values, some of the NES titles, when Gary Bracey really took over running the, uh, uh, the show in terms of uh, development. Um, yeah, Adam's Family Values I would have liked to have perhaps been slightly more involved with. But whether that's because the game was good at the end, or would I made it worse, I don't know. But it, you know, it was a game I liked. Um, I didn't have a huge amount of involvement. I did. Um, I kind of got involved with Lemmings in the, on the Game Boy, and um, but it was just really to sort out some, help sort out some of the early technical difficulties of displaying so many moving Lemmings on a, on a system that only had twenty sprites or so. Um, and, Good. Well, Ocean managed to secure its first movie licenses in 1985 with Rambo, Short Circuit and Robocop. Uh, and in 1986, it would then sign a deal with Taito and Data East to port their arcade games like Renegade, Operation Wolf and New Zealand Story. Did you welcome these deals as a game developer or did you feel it stifled your ability to create original games? Um, yeah, so my personal view is I didn't really care. Right. I, okay. I, yeah, I, I enjoyed actually writing the games, solving the technical problems within the games, and I didn't care that it was um, famous, not famous. I, I mean, Knight Rider was the one where we didn't like because Knight Rider had been um, licensed, and then somebody tried to write it because I wasn't available, and somebody else tried to write it, and then John came to me and said, "You've got two weeks to write Knight Rider." Uh, and I really didn't want to do that in two weeks, uh, so I just threw something together. And it, um, yeah, I think Street Hawk as well was. Sorry, was it Night Rider Street Street Hawk? Sorry, Street Hawk. Okay. Yeah, memories going Street Hawk. <laughs> um, yeah, just threw the game together, and uh, yeah, it's horrendous. I'm not proud of it. Yeah. So um, I didn't care about. It was a good thing was you get to go to see the movie before anybody else in the country. We'd have our own special showings, and all half of Ocean would go to it. That was good. Um, and you were kind of constrained a little bit by the movie. It had to have some relativity. I know I struggled with uh, Short Circuit, which is one of my favourite games that I've written. Um, and um, I ended up switching to a kind of adventure game. Mm -hmm. uh, David did like that so he i had to write another kind of pseudo action game and put it on the other side of the tape but uh, um yeah so you're restricted in some respects to the things you can do on the spectrum and relating to the game itself so the difficult part was trying to match what you could do within the time period to some relevance to the movie yeah and never ending story was a difficult one when we were looking at the design for that because yeah what do you do i mean that ended up a text adventure, didn't it? Never ending it story. Did. Yes, yeah, I remember that one. Um, and I guess if you're talking movie licenses as opposed to arcade licenses, yeah, you are given a lot more freedom to um, work within the realms of the movie. Mm. It, it's, it's different. Because I was working for Ocean, you, you had a product to deliver. And if that, it had a title, it had a, uh, a tie-in, then you delivered it to that title. So if it was a film title, you had to do something around that. If you were working at home on your own in your bedroom, starting your first game, 
you spent the time doing gameplay, uh, dealing with technical things like glitches and sounds, and um, so you had perhaps more freedom. Um, and it would have been nice to have more freedom or longer time to produce the game so that we could put more. We were very proud of the technical content that we could do. It was throughout the period of the, the games were being produced for the Spectrum. We were getting better and better at producing things like sound, et cetera, and things like that, but, uh, and, and scrolling. Um, big argument about who invented or scrolling, but um, let's not go there. Um, <laughs> yeah, so... Um, yeah, it would have been nice to have longer, but we didn't. We had a film release. We had a film release date. The, the game should come out with it, so you were you were restricted somewhat. Yeah, even going back to Daley Thompson with his Olympics appearance, it was very tied to the time that yeah, it had to come it out. it was, yeah. Well, with success came the inevitable piracy, and I understand you were involved in trying to tackle piracy at Ocean. What was your part in that? Um, there's a few things. I, there's, there's a documentary that BBC Two did, and David went off to them. To the market, the local markets, and and picked up quite a few spectrum and brought them back, and he said, "But yeah, are they, are these real?" And the answer was obviously no for some of them, but not obvious for others. And um, yeah, we realised that actually this is probably going on all over the country, and uh, you know we could only guess at how many of the real ones um, versus the pirated ones were being sold. But we, we viewed it as being probably a significant figure. And we knew about bedroom coffee and everybody did it. Um, but this wasn't. This was kind of a commercial. We're going to pinch your game as soon as it comes out and we're going to sell it into everybody but the, the major chains, that you know, the WX Smiths and that. Um, so it was significant. And um, we, had, we had a few ideas. Um, uh, one thing, well, for the disc based stuff later on, by the way, we, we, we had a, an idea that was taken off us by the MOD because it was uh, secret and um, we couldn't use it. Um, but we in, uh, involved some people who've been looking at tape protection systems. And then I produced my own as well. And the idea was to kind of make it difficult without the right audio equipment um, to make duplicates. And one thing we found working with the engineers at Ablex uh, was that um, actually that some of the cheaper cassette decks that we had in those days, not the hi-fi ones, were actually better for copying. So we could, if, you, if you made your waveform a certain way, and when I say waveform, so when, when the loader happens, it, it, it produces a, a, a wave sound that's out, coming out of the spectrum is square. It goes down and, and, and has a, a frequency of, I don't know, two kilohertz or something like that. Um, uh, but when you put it on tape, because of the electronics involved, the, the corners get rounded and the square parts. And the better the hi-fi, in some cases, the more rounded that became. So we had to work out uh, certain sets of frequencies that would work well um, on the duplication system in Ablex, but not necessarily well in the hi-fi. They also had to change the duplication machines in Ablex as well, and the masters were slightly different. We, we took some time working on that. So we did that with other protection systems and then later with mine. Um, and then what happened was that people started to hack the actual protection system itself. So we came up with more and more ingenious ways of actually protecting that code. And uh, I've got a few tricks up the sleeve that I've used subsequently on the PC. And um, still, you know, I've not, I've not seen somebody um, disassemble my protection system and explain how it works. They've cracked it, but they've cracked it in theory in an audio way rather than uh, cracking the code. So right, so good. a fairly successful system or, or, you know, series of systems that you've come up with mm. then. Um, as opposed to, say, I've got Robocop 3 here with its dongle, which is a, a famous one that was very quickly yeah. <laughs> cracked. Yeah, it got hacked anyway in the end. Yeah. But, well, um, you find another way around it, you know. Yeah. And just personally, what was your personal view on piracy? Was it straight up its theft, or did you have a slightly softer view on it? Um, I think certainly for commercial, it's theft. Mm -hmm. yeah. for, for the guy at home, uh, and, young, and most of the young kids, um, if you couldn't afford to buy the game and you copied it, I didn't approve, but I, I wouldn't go 
calling the police on him. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you started selling tens of them in schoolyards, then that's a different matter. Yeah. It's, yeah, not for profit, absolutely not. Um, and really not at all because yeah, you stifle the growth of the industry, not so much then, but now um, things like it's difficult to get the revenue back on movies and things like that. And, um, you know, they spend a lot of money on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't agree with it at all, really. Okay. We, were, we were founder members of, um, uh, is it FACT? Federation against... Right FAST? There. Was it FAST, FAST or FACT? FACT, FACT. Yeah. okay. FACT, FACT, yeah. One of the founder members. Okay. Uh, vague to remember attending a couple of meetings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, your career in the book here becomes a little hazy as we leave the um, leave the 80s into the 90s. I think you state in the book that you, you don't remember a great deal and you got quite burnt out um, in the 90s. <laughs> As a developer, yeah. Yeah. So was Ocean that relentless on its staff? Was burnout a common problem? I don't think it was Ocean. I think it was me. Um, Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, there was constant deadlines and very little time between games. And um, I also supported that in a way because of my work ethic at the time. Um, So, yeah, I was burnt out. I was tired. And uh, um, but I, I moved to more towards um, helping the other guys in the spectrum. We had a little office across the way. We we expanded outside of the church, so I took on the running offices across the road. And then we eventually moved to Castleton, and I ended up looking after the mastering and um, production of all the Nintendo stuff as well. So occasionally getting involved with the test testing and uh, some of the designs, but very little. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what are you? Um, where are you in life now, Paul? Are you are you still working? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and still in predominantly with software. Um, I won't say who we work for, but um, uh, we look after our company uh, has a customer um, that is in the railways. So we're looking after um, the software required to get all the systems in the railways talking to one another. Uh, trying to eliminate delay and things. Um, I, I don't write software anymore. I have teams of people who do that. Um, but um, I enjoy it. I still have technical design challenges, and I still relish them. Um, I'd rather not be a manager. I'd rather be, still be a techie. So, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I suppose most of my day is a solution arch- what you call solution architect. I'm an enterprise architect as well. So, yeah, yeah no, it's good. Um, I'm glad to hear you're still in the industry in some way. That's really good. So, Paul, um, the ocean story is a big one, which uh, I hope to explore further in the future. Loads and loads of people worked there, but I've really enjoyed hearing your particular recollections. So uh, thank you for sharing your memories today, Paul. You're welcome. And um, if you'd like to read a whole lot more about the, the story, head on over to Fusion Retro Books. There's the Ocean Story book available in paperback and hardback. So go and take a look at that. I recommend it. And Paul's got a chapter in there as well. It's a great book. There we go. Thank you again, Paul. Take care. Cheers. Bye now. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.